I check that you are live. Yes, sir. I think we are. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Apollo Amoko. Um, uh, for for now, I teach at the. Uh, I'm an English professor with affiliates starters at the Center for African Studies. Uh, welcome to what I am designating our impossible panel, uh, <laughs> and I will try to navigate with all the uh, diverse writers that we have this morning. And I thought I would begin by making a couple of uh, uh, remarks in an attempt to frame the conversation in a, a way, though I have told my panelists that they are free men and women in what used to be a free country, so they are at liberty to take what I am saying and run with it in whatever uh, direction. Uh, and I think what I uh, want us to be thinking about is the work of art in the age of crisis. Uh, and to take from that the fact that uh, uh, Chenwara Achebe and James Baldwin were also writers who were confronting, confronting uh, what it means to be an artist in the age of crisis, a uh, crisis that had to do with uh, colonialism in the context of Africa and racism and segregation in the context of the US. And I thought one of the places I, would, I wanted to touch on is to go back to the conversation we had in the wake of the movie last night. I do not know how many of the audience were with us last night. And I, 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 I spoke about how captivating and arresting and haunting the movie was. And I was particularly struck uh, by the image of James Baldwin facing a monument to Martin Luther King and talking with utter contempt about the ways in which King has been transformed from this fierce moral critic into a kind of denuded and decontextualized secular saint. Uh, and the urgency of his anti-racist, anti-capitalist, anti-militarism critique has been all but lost. And uh, he has um, been reduced to uh, one particular speech. And it's worth thinking about King for just a minute because I would propose that he was not just an incredible activist, but I think he was also in his own right, something of an uh, artist because his speeches were extraordinary rhetorical performances that were also matched by the mesmerizing oratory with which he delivered, delivered them. And yet he has been reduced to not just one speech, I have a dream, but only the last part of I have a dream where his uh, yearning for uh, utopia that had not yet found its form has been reduced as if it was a magical incantation that erased racism by his mere interest of them. And the parts of the speech where he's saying America has given her Negro population a bad check, a check that has come back marked insufficient fact, funds are erased. And even more problematically, uh, his uh, letter from a Birmingham jail where he's saying more and more, I have come to believe that the Negro's problem is more the white moderate than the Ku Klux Klaner has been erased. And even yes, what? what is a time of reckoning, his critique of US militarism and imperialism and racism in an international frame is completely underappreciated. And he has been monumentalized, not simply by a revanchist racist right wing, but also in an odd way by ostensibly progressive forces. I have in mind, for instance, the disturbing spectacle of the first uh, black US president, Barack Obama, repeatedly invoking King never more problematically than during his speech, accepting the Nobel Prize that he had done nothing to earn, where he begins by paying homage to uh, Martin Luther King only to give in his own soaring rhetoric 
an unapologetic defense of U.S. militarism and imperialism before accepting the peace price. As Cornel West puts it, it's a hell of a thing to be a war president accepting the Nobel Peace Prize. Okay. And, uh, but as I said last night, it troubles me that Chenwa Rachebe has himself been transformed into something of a monument and the ways in which things fall apart has become hyper canonized and fetishized. And uh, it is a justly uh, important and influential novel, but its critique has been attenu attenuated and reduced to <coughs> withering critique of uh, colonial racism and insufficient attention has been paid to his descent from the kind of jingoistic or triumphant anti-colonial nationalism that was sweeping the continent in the late 50s and early 60s and and that um his warning his kind of prophetic warning about it takes more than casting aside the york of colonialism to liberate the continent was disregarded uh now Baldwin has similarly, it seems to me, been transformed into a kind of monument in his own hypercanonicity, and nowhere more clearly than the film's uh, erasure of his own uneasy situation within the context of the civil rights era, and the way they would just elliptically have him say, uh, Martin Luther King and Medgar Evers and Malcolm X, these were all my friends. And that remark is clearly true as far as it goes, as was the remark that he was uh, one of the organizer of the March on Washington. And yet it was elided, the fact was elided that they wouldn't give him a speaking slot during that, uh, that March on Washington. And, and the fact that he himself was kind of ambivalent about aspects of the civil rights era and that his sexuality made him the target of homophobia. And I think Zaya Jan Mohammed was pointing this out in his presentation. Uh, and so I guess I want us to be thinking about the work, the artist and the ways in which the artist critique is susceptible to denuding and fetishization, not simply by the forces of reaction, but also by a kind of erasure within ostensibly progressive forces. Uh, and finally, let me say something about uh, the fierce agency of the moment we are living now, where in a sense, we continue to wrestle with questions about racism and police brutality and the manners in which uh, racist history is monumentalized and erased. And we have, for instance, the ways in which uh, in the US, the election of the first black president, admittedly a centrist establishment figure is swiftly followed by the election in a manner of speaking of an unabashed, unapologetic, a racist who is riding a wave of revankist white supremacy, white Christian nationalism, homophobia, and so on and so forth. And uh, meanwhile, in Africa, we also have uh, the return of a certain kind of neo-authoritarianism, if I can coin that phrase. I have in mind uh, the folks like Yoweri Kaguta Museveni or the somewhat admired but megalomaniacal Paul Kagame of Rwanda or the reprehensible let, uh, uh, recently deceased Pierre Nkurusinza of Burundi or for that matter the almost cartoonishly villainous and buffoonish bombastic John Pombe Magufuli of Tanzania. Um, and at the same time, these countries continue to wrestle with a kind of national security state that was never fully decolonized. So much so that, for instance, 
uh, the coronavirus crisis is dealt with more as a police matter than a public health matter, and citizens are brutalized in the name of having their health protected. And uh, finally, I'll talk about the sort of neo-colonial moment that's uh, not just about the neoliberal uh, market fundamentalist consensus that seem to have a stranglehold, but uh, also the fact that there was a story not too long ago about in The Intercept and then the New York Times about how big oil, uh, as it faces a precarious future with oil, is investing heavily on plastic and that they were embarked on a um, campaign to get African countries that had recently passed bans on plastic to lift them. And they were using their might, particularly against the Kenyan government, in the belief that if they could roll one of the biggest economies in the continent, uh, the rest of the countries would fall back right along and uh, remove the bans they had instituted. Anyway, I am rambling on. So what I want us to talk about is what's the role of the artist? How does the artist bear witness in this moment of crisis? And I will stage an artificially polemical binary between, on the one hand, Chenua Rachebe's, uh, the uh, novelist as teacher, where he invokes, he disavows notion of arts for art's sake in the context of the crisis of coloniality and says the, the novelist has a moral imperative to engage in a kind of pedagogy, aesthetics as an open-ended pedagogy. And on the other hand, James Baldwin's early uh, polemic, everybody's protest novel, in which even though he was acutely invested in anti-oppressive struggle, he nevertheless makes a fierce argument on behalf of aesthetic autonomy. And I would love to hear what you as writers do with these issues. And with those remarks, I will turn over the forum to you all. I will start with Zahir. Um, sure. So yeah, I was hoping so. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a, it's a real pleasure um, to be here. Um, I think so. I've been inspired. I was inspired to participate in this conversation for two reasons. One is uh, a paper I wrote, um, which I presented, um, looking at the film "I'm Not Your Negro," um, as well as Justin Ward's um, anthology, recent anthology, looking at James Baldwin's writings. And while I enjoyed both of those, what I found interesting was not much mention of, of James Baldwin's uh, sexual identity or of um, the religious conflict that I think is at the root of so much of James Baldwin's writings. Um, and also, I was also interested in exploring the ways in which oftentimes in creative writing circles, James Baldwin is sort of brought out to talk about issues of race, um, but oftentimes only issues of race, whereas his connections to Turkey, his impact on on Turkey is in, its impact on other countries is oftentimes not included, but, but as well as sort of those fierce conversations he was having uh, around re religion and identity. So oftentimes when I would ask professors, who should I read to, to talk about religion and identity? Um, Baldwin's name doesn't really come up. It's like Baldwin's the guy like kind of like the medicine to, to bring up to talk about race. Um, in, in terms of Chinua Chebe, I mean, this is something that um, I feel very, very, um, flatter to be part of this esteemed panel. For me, my, my family is from Tanzania. Uh, we're Indians from Tanzania. And so Chinua Achebe, my interaction with him is partly a comment that he made, I believe in 1975, where he referred to English as an African language. And so for, for a lot of the Indian diaspora in Tanzania, my family has been in Tanzania since the, the late uh, 1800s. It, it really gave a lot of members of my family sort of permission to write because for many of the Indian diaspora sort of finding themselves in between language. So I found with, with, with both of these, 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 these writers, bo both of them have given me different aspects of uh, ways in which to find my own identity as a writer. Baldwin and the way that Baldwin has explored um, religion and sort of pushed up against religion, um, as well as, of course, race and sexuality. But Chinua Achebe, in terms of finding my place as 
uh, as a person descendant of immigrants from Africa, Indian immigrants from Africa, but like the idea that the way that my father had taught me that English, the English that I write in today is an African language that I'd have to make it my own. And so to think about that in a different way. And so I really wanted to be a part of this forum to sort of express my debt to these two writers. But of course, I'm, 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 I'd love to hear pushback and feedback from others about this. Thank you, that was very succinct. And well, we'll continue on with the person that's next on my screen, which is Major, Major Jackson. Uh, thank you. It's my honor to, to be on this panel. And Apollo, I'm intrigued by your binary, and I'm intrigued by um, your framing and contemplating what many of us have observed, particularly writers, the monumentalizing and the almost uh, innervate what, how that innervates the power of both writers, both writers' work. Um, some of this is is owed very simply to the flattening of time. You mentioned the hypercanonization of certain words, but I feel like time um, will inevitably kind of distill what was so essential about uh, both writers. Our jobs as writers, particularly those of us who put ourselves in a continuum of consciousness, is to um, reintroduce elements of of their work or writing, including Martin Luther. Even include, I'm happy you mentioned Martin Luther King as a writer, and artist himself. But the more poignant, the more uh, political, the innovative aspects of their work have to come to the fore, including what Thay Harris is talking about, which is what are the what are the the regions of their thinking, of their uh, writing that particularly has great resonance for us now. I cannot help but think about Baldwin when I think about the political freedoms and liberties my queer brothers and sisters and gender nonconformists and gender fluid people exercise now. I can draw a very clear line from Baldwin to this, this particular uh, present moment. Regarding the question of, of crises, I think I cannot help but think about uh, Chen Yue Chebe as well as Baldwin in the sense that as writers like Zahir, they help to kind of create a foundation for who I am uh, today. So inevitably, I'm going to um, name call them. I'm going to revere them. Like, I think that's just part of what we do as writers, when we when we find ourselves looking for uh, looking for models, for me, their models has been one of a rich critique of whiteness and power and white supremacy. Something that Baldwin, particularly, I've turned to because what he what he underscores is the cycle of oppression. Uh, that is owed to a country that hinges itself upon a tenuous idea uh, of race. And I think that is one of the legacies, along with Zahir is saying, um, this kind of transformation of self that is so linked with transformation of society and it's always intersectional. And I think we as writers have to come back, continue to come back to their work and not go for the um, the uh, bite-sized, available, um, often quoted, but look for those other kind of margins that go unhighlighted uh, in our writings. That's us as intellectuals and thinkers, as writers. I don't blame the public for making monuments of them, but we being critical beings have to go and find what is underneath that work that makes them constant uh, constantly relevant. Did we lose your sound? No, I stopped. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Um, um, Terry. 
Good morning, and thank you so much, y'all, for inviting me on, to be on this panel. I'm really excited about it. And so when I when I consider the contributions of Achebe and Baldwin, I have to think about um, my own development as a reader and a writer. Um, I always, always, I'm sorry, it's an echo. I'm thinking this. I always um, think about the fact that I started reading Baldwin as a teenager, a young, uh, almost a preteen, because that was a book on my mother's bookshelf. And um, but Achebe, I wasn't introduced um, to until later, um, recent, very recently, like um, just a few years ago, as I was working on my master's um, in writing and um, in English and creative writing. Um, but still, immediately, I was able to draw a connection and a comparison in terms of their work and the politics of their work, but in particular, um, their ability to tell not only their personal stories um, through fiction, but um, to tell the stories of the masses and um, look at uh, political issues such as colonization and looking at the, the horrible racism <laughs> that we continue to experience in the United States. And so um, both of those authors inform my writing in terms of like tonight, today I read uh, the story that um, discusses um, how uh, Christianity has, uh, has overtaken everything and to to have a love of uh, the religion of your ancestors is al almost considered anti-christian and and you know it's a mix it's, it's a mix it's, it doesn't have to be either or and um in terms of my politics being present in my writing I draw from these two writers again um, and their ability to tell the story of what is happening day to day and how relevant it is to our, our existence today. Um, I think one thing that we often uh, leave undiscussed is uh, um, introducing our children and the next generations to these grades is so important that we talk to them not only about, oh, you need to read the book, but why reading their books are important. Um, they do, both of the authors do such a wonderful, wonderful job of, of outlining um, how our, our walks in the world, how our walk in the world is present and how our walk in the world is important and how our stories are important. Um, and I, I think it, it's just, it's a necessary thing to do to have our children understand that their stories shape the world and how we see um, the world. And, and so, for example, this summer we worked with, um, uh, youth at the University of Florida um, and the CROP program, and that's College Reach Out program or outreach program. Um, and we did creative communications. And so the thing that we kept pushing and mention, and of course, we I mentioned uh, James Baldwin as an American author that they needed to read and Toni Morrison and even Octavia Butler is that your story matters. And I think Achebe and Baldwin both do a wonderful, wonderful job in making us know that our stories matter. And um, so they have been uplifted as martyrs. Um, and, and to me, I do understand how some of their relevance, uh, some of their uh, political um, points have been erased and, and watered, uh, watered down. Um, but okay, it's up to us as writers and educators to go back and um, you know inject that important information that is is being left off. Uh, and one more thing, 
in terms of James Baldwin and his sexuality here recently, um, we had a dedication um, uh, to a library um, component um, for a, a great um, oral historian named James, um, Joel Buchanan. And I grew up around um, <clears throat> Dr. Buchanan um, he was a power force in, in uh, getting Black people in particular uh, in our uh, historically Black communities um, to tell their stories. Um, but one of the panelists um, in, celebra in his celebration discussed um, how muted his sexuality was. And we were just all, I was absolutely in shock at how many people were angry at her for bringing that up it was clear he was a gay black man. It, uh, it informed how he moved in the world and everything he did. Um, he was, but they acted like it took away from the importance of his work. It needed to be mentioned. It didn't need to be hidden um, because that, that hiding of, um, of his sexuality really, um, it hurt him, you know. I knew him personally. It hurt him. It hurt how he. It hurt him, and it 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 took away how he was able to celebrate his life and celebrate his work, and even um, have the ability to love. And so, I appreciate that you brought that that point up uh, about his sexuality. Thank you very much, Terry. Uh, I should have mentioned that we have temporarily lost one of our palanists, Kole. Um, he is proctoring an exam right now in an instance of inopportune coincidence, but he will hopefully be with us in the second half of our discussion. Uh, Stanley. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, great. First, I want to thank everyone at the Center for African Studies at the University of Florida for uh, inviting me and to be here with all of you distinguished uh, writers. Also, I want to give a quick thank you to the folks at Duo Studios who are for their technical expertise and and putting this all together and making it function. You know. Um, before I'm before I'm a writer, I'm a I'm a black man. And I think uh, for me, Baldwin so eloquently articulates that, that rage that, that can transform into trauma that we walk around with every day, where we keep suppressed. And if I were to um, try to, try to, I guess, express it, it may come out in one one foul word as mother. So I appreciate James Baldwin for how he can so eloquently articulate that what I am feeling. I know other people like myself are feeling uh, trying to navigate this this America. Um, I also am attracted to Baldwin because and, and and I'm more I'm more acquainted with James Baldwin than I am with uh, Chinua Achebe, uh, just for the for the matter that um, the environment that I that I grew up in in America, and I think that I'm, I'm attracted to Baldwin as as an artist, as witness and truth teller. So I, I, I'm I uh, more attracted to the, the how he pulls back the covers uh, and lays bare the big lie that is America and makes them come to grips about their, you know, look in the mirror and come to grips about their true self, about what it is. So uh, that's what uh, I try to do as an artist is uh, be, be a, a witness, whatever, in, in this space that I, that I occupy as an artist. So once again, thank you. And um, um, Mr. Apollo Amoko, is that say that right? Yeah, yeah. It's hard okay. to I, I, uh, I want to warn you, all right? You cannot talk about um, Barack Obama. Are, are you in Africa right now? No, I'm your neighbor in UF. You are, oh, you're in the UF? Oh, and you're in America? 
You cannot talk about Barack Obama. You, you will get out a bunch of backlash. And I was so I was just so happy that you did because I love my brother Cornell West. And one thing about Cornell West, he is consistent. And I was having this conversation yesterday with someone about Barack Obama, and uh, and I was telling him about Cornell West. Cornell West is anything else. He is consistent about criticizing the empire that is America. And for whatever uh, the symbolic whatever that Barack Obama represented as being a black president, he still, nevertheless, after his inauguration, he was the head of that empire. And, and Cornel West continued to criticize that empire. So uh, thank you for that. I'm done. Wow, that was very, very succinct. Uh, yeah. OK. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Lovely. Um, I'm speaking well, to I'm... everybody. Yes. <laughs> well, I think everybody else shook their head. Um, so I would like to uh, begin my intervention uh, sort of by inserting an autobiographical note, um, because this is uh, this celebration uh, that the conference represents um, foregrounds um, a, an important moment in my own evolution uh, socially and intellectually. Um, and so the two writers that were here celebrating um, are particularly uh, important um, writers in the, my intellectual um, development. Um, anybody who's read me uh, with any consistency would recognize that Chinua Achebe, um, first of all, was a person who invited me to America uh, uh, to be the founding editor of a magazine that he established with other um, um, African intellectuals and, and writers and so on. But I met Achebe um, years ago when I was in high school. Uh, before high school, I had read his work because my parents had happened to have a copy of Things Fell Apart uh, in the house. And I read it at the time when I hadn't quite understood the way that fiction even functions. And so I remember reading this um, story about Okonkwo who kills an adoptive son. And even though at the end of the novel, Okonkwo himself commits suicide, um, I walked around looking at any imposing male figure that I saw and feeling a sense that this was Okonkwo and that this man was going to grab me and kill me. So I would actually, if I saw a big imposing man, I'll, I'll, I'll turn and flee. Um, years later, having finished uh, college, I was hired by a newspaper um, to uh, a magazine, actually, uh, as a feature writer. And I went to visit a friend of mine who happened to be from Ogidi, Chino Achebe's uh, hometown. And here I was, uh, by this time, I had read everything that Achebe had written several times over. And I was raving and saying, I wish I were from Ogidi so I could tell people that Achebe belonged to me uh, in a unique way. And this young woman had a wry smile and she said to me, do you know that Achebe is my uncle? I said, you're kidding me. And she said, in fact, his house is around the corner and Achebe happened to be home from the University of Nigeria where he was a professor and um, head of the Institute of African Studies and she said, would you want to, to meet him? So we walked to Achebe's home and he was there. And uh, if you ever met Achebe, you would um, uh, recognize that quiet, gracious, self-effacing uh, person that he was. And so he was a bit bemused as I just, you know, fretted and, you know, around him. And I was just in awe. Um, so I told uh, Chinua Achebe that I had just been hired by a magazine and I was going to start in a couple of weeks. And I said, I'd like to interview you. 
Achebe said, give me his telephone number, home number at the time there were no cell phones, and said, let me know anytime you, you are ready. So I reported for duty in Lagos and told my editor that um, I had Chino Achebe's contact and he'd agreed to give me an interview anytime I wished. And the editor said, that's going to be your first assignment. So I called Achebe, we fixed on a date, and the magazine sent me out um, on a flight to Enugu, gave me enough money to stay in a hotel for one week. And I met Achebe on the appointed day in his office at the university and interviewed him for close to three hours. At the end of which he said, this is one of, this is perhaps my most exhaustive interviews anywhere in the world. And so I returned to my hotel room and some of my friends who were admirers of Achebe gathered in the room and they wanted to listen uh, to the voice of this man that we had all read as high school students or as college students. And guess who had that voice? I did. And so I pressed my tape recorder and there was silence. I put in another tape, silence. I put in yet a third tape, it was silent. So I had interviewed Achebe for close to three hours, but my tape recorder had picked up not one word that Achebe had said, it had malfunctioned. And I was so in awe of Achebe and being in his presence that as he spoke, I took absolutely no note. I was just gaping at him. There's actually a picture of it on my Instagram account and on my Facebook account. You could see me just gazing at this man, not taking any notes at all. Now I had to call him back in panic. And I said to him, I'm sorry, I wasted your time. I said, but if I returned to Lagos and told my editor, yes, I interviewed Chinua Achebe for almost three hours, but no, I have nothing to show for it. I'll say, I'll lose my job. So I said, could I return tomorrow? Just give me 15 to 20 minutes, you know, so that I'll say maybe what my plan was that I'll have a very short interview. I'll return to Lagos and say to the editor, yes, Achebe gave me an interview, but he was in a hurry. So he did it, gave me just 20 minutes. And Achebe said, I can't do it tomorrow. I have some uh, hectic schedule, but he said, if you can come the day after, I'll give you as much time as you wanted. So two days later, First of all, I had to borrow money to extend my stay in the hotel because my <laughs> the money that the magazine had paid had run out. Then I went around to friends because this was a city where I also went to college. So I knew some journalists. So I went and borrowed two extra tape recorders in addition to mine. So I went with three. And as Achebe spoke, I took elaborate notes in case all three uh, tape recorders uh, malfunctioned. And so this was how Chinu Achebe uh, my first encounter with him, my first serious encounter with him, uh, and to encounter him in a moment of such extraordinary generosity um, was just um, incredible. So I've written about this, how Chinua Achebe saved my career. And also um, his moral example. So subsequently, so we became close. Um, he really came, flattered me by saying he loved uh, the feature, the cover story that I wrote out of that encounter. And so um, he began to confide in me. So when one of his books got a major prize or a new translation or when uh, his poem got turned into uh, turned to music, uh, Achebe, I was the first person that Achebe told in the media. So I became the Achebe expert. There came a time when, even when other newspapers wanted to interview him, they had to come through me and became something of an intermediary. And so, Apollo, it's, it's a way of sort of entering into um, uh, Achebe as teacher. So here was Achebe who had instructed me and instruct us through his fiction, to, through his poetry, through his polemical interventions in African and Nigerian politics, but I will say most fiercely and powerfully through his humanity, the depth of his humanity uh, was the most stirring uh, part of Achebe. So in a lot of, in, in a very interesting way, it was Achebe then who introduced me to Baldwin. So I traveled uh, to America and came back 
and give me a copy of Jen, uh, Baldwin's uh, The Fire Next Time. And when I read this book, I've reread it numerous times over the years, there was nothing like it in the SF form. Here was a mastery of essay writing, but more important, here was the writer as prophet. Um, and so these two then became my teachers. And so in a lot of ways, the tension between Achebe's claim of the writer as teacher, which is not a simplistic claim of um, uh, sort of the writer uh, teaching a pupil that one plus one is two, but a writer who uh, fundamentally encourages us as readers to learn how to ask questions, which is the ultimate gift uh, that you can give. And so Achebe learned, taught us in his reading of Joseph Conrad in An Image of Africa, um, Racism in Conrad's Out of Darkness. Achebe taught us a different way of reading a, a text that was settled as uh, a canonical text in Western, um, Western literature. Achebe uh, introduced us to uh, important lacunae, if you like, in this otherwise um, globally uh, respected fiction. And if you look at the moment, um, I mean, when I, I, I read Things Fall Apart, for example, and you read the opening of Things Fall Apart, and that opening, um, one can spend weeks talking about the opening, uh, those opening paragraphs that Okonkwo was well known throughout the nine villages and even beyond. His fame rested on solid personal achievements. As a young man of 18, he had brought honor to his village by throwing Amalinze the cat. Amalinze was a great wrestler who for seven years was unbeaten from Omorphia to Mbaina. He was called the cat because his back will never touch the earth. It was this man that Okonkwo threw in a fight which the old men agreed was one of the fiercest since the founder of their town engaged the spirit of the wilds for seven days and seven nights. When you read that novel, you see Achebe introducing us to something that he gets to talk about much later, the tension between individual, the individual and, the, and his community, okay? Uh, a different way of being in the world. And also the ways in which in an Aboriginal worldview, the human world is not a different, is not distant, but it's integrated with that mystical, ineffable world of mystery and magic. So we see all these two worlds merged. But at the end of that novel, by the end of that novel, we have returned that Chebe points us to the danger that we face, the danger of living in the linear world of Europe. Uh, because the drama that is staged at the end of the novel is that Europe becomes uh, a bidder for the black body. So Okonkwo, the great hero of this novel, has committed suicide. And so the whole conversation now is who owns his body? And by extension, who owns his story? And so Achebe has told us this man's fascinating story the story of his community in its plenitude. But the white man steps in and says, okay, this is such an intriguing story. I'm going to put it as part of, you know, my memorialization of my experience as a colonial officer. And he says, I'm going to write a chapter on it. And then from a chapter, he ends up saying a reasonable paragraph. That's all it's going to take. So in the hands of Europe, Achebe warns us, the black body becomes irrelevant, insignificant, and the black story is reduced and indeed erased. <clears throat> in a lot of ways in Fifth Avenue uptown, James Baldwin sort of reminds us of that same kind of tension when he writes 
that the Negroes want to be treated like men. And he said, this is a perfectly straightforward uh, statement containing only seven words. But this same seemingly uh, 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 simple statement, he says, has been a mystery, has cannot be grasped by people who have mastered Kant and Hegel and Shakespeare and so on. And that's the drama that we face even in our contemporary world. Uh, one more remark before I end. Um, this particular moment is haunted for me in two different ways. So in North America, we're of course uh, facing the continuing specter of the black body and how the black body can be just snuffed out, life, the life can be snuffed out of the black body um, by official sanction by anybody in uniform. But then over the last two weeks in Nigeria, young people in Nigeria have risen to confront um, the political leadership on the, on, in the country that for decades have offered them nothing but misery, poverty, and devastation. So this young man finally said, hell no. Um, again, it started uh, as uh, a resistance against police brutality. But the young man said, we actually have to extend this. The tragedy in Nigeria, which uh, consistently belongs now in uh, numerous indexes of poor nations in the world, the tragedy is that every Nigerian governor each month, each month, takes far more money in compensation than the US president gets in a year. And there are 36 governors. And then you have legislators, senators, and members of the House of Reps who collect as much, if not much more, than the US president. Okay? And meanwhile, the minimum wage in Nigeria is less than $100. And there are people who have to feed their families, pay their rent, do transportation, buy clothing on this income. And so the kid said, we want more fundamental changes. And for their resistance, two days ago, the government set out soldiers to turn off the lights in the city and to open fire on them. And anything between 40, and close to 80 of the protesters were killed. A governor in Nigeria then came out and said, oh, we're happy that there were no casualties because in the mindset of the Nigerian state, if you are poor and young and you died, you are not a body, you don't count. So the governor without irony without a sense of shame, declares that there were no iron, uh, no casualties. And yesterday, after more than 24 hours, the Nigerian president gave a speech, but it was a defiant speech where he's accusing the international community of trying to foment trouble in the country. And so all of this tragic history weighs on me. And I'm aware that Chinua Achebe, this was the project yeah, I, that he engaged with throughout his yeah, life. I express so, you to wrap up. I, I just wrapped up. The discussion. I just wrapped up. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. And um, finally, we have Julie, who uh, Julie, who has been incredibly patient. Thank you so much. Um, and also, thank you for the invitation. And I'm just super honored to be here among such distinguished writers. Um, okay, that story that you were telling about uh, Chino Achebe saving your life, saving your work was uh, pretty amazing. And it made me think a lot about the, yes. the trouble he had publishing Things Fall Apart. And the, the, the whole, you know, the, the, one, the one copy of his uh, manuscript that ended up in, mm -hmm. in a trash can somewhere in the UK and then that whole process before it. So someone also had to mm -hmm. intervene for him as well. 
And I think that, so in some ways, our job as writers and as educators and as editors is to look for those writers out there who need to be saved, right? And, and to be an, as generous, as gracious as Achebe and others have been um, to, to, to help the next generation. Um, to your question about that binary between the sort of moral imperative and the sort of arts for art's sake, um, in some ways, I think that that binary, um, it's an interesting binary, but I think also, you know, like what uh, Okay and Terry both mentioned that their introduction to these authors was from their, their households. And likewise, when I, you know, my parents were students at the university, had lots of textbooks on their shelf, but the two novels that they had were Things Fall Apart, uh, Chino Chino Things Fall Apart, and then there was also a volume of poems by Wole Shoenka. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember growing up and, you know, I think at some point in my teen years, I picked up the book to read it for the first time, but I don't think I would have read it in the same way if the book had been assigned. Mm -hmm. And I will say that like my, my father had like a chalkboard and like we had to like practice writing our name on it. So it <laughs> felt like school. Mm -hmm. I think if he sat us down and tried to do that with things fall apart, it wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had the same experience. Mm -hmm. I, I found the book on my own because I, you know, I ended up reading lots of those books on the shelf. And when I came across that book, what happened was I was immersed into another world. Um, and that the, the world was just that first page that okay was reading aloud to us. That, that, that first page just drew me into this world and it, and it prompted all these questions about Nigeria, about my family, about our history, about the war, about colonization. Um, and so in some ways, I think that the work itself if it's done very well, in, the real task of the writer is to illuminate, to examine what's happening in the world. Stanley mentioned the expose the lie. Mm -hmm. I think that that's, I think that that is what the work, and so in, in that sense, the work is already inherently political. And I think the world itself is political, our bodies, right? Especially those of, as, as you know, colonized subjects, our bodies are inherently politicized. And we're seeing evidence of that that's going on right now in Nigeria and also throughout the US. I think this year itself, this explosion of uprisings, is, mm -hmm. I think this moment is so important. Um, and I think I, one of the things that I think a lot about is how um, that question about the body as a physical- I am sorry. Right. And then the sort of the digital space and how, mm -hmm. like, how does that work as a mediator, mediator of all of these you know, it's different voices. I mean, I'm I'm engaging in this conversation. I've been listening to different conversations about the NSARS movement for several years now. So mm -hmm. it's interesting to see all of this come, you know, the actual physical, you know, this 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 uprising happening on the ground right now. Mm -hmm. And I wonder a lot about how the the digital space alters or shapes the ways that we engage with this politics, both in our creative writing and intellectual writing and in the actual actions, you know. Um, I think sometimes I thought for a long time that there was this danger that people would just be sitting behind their computers typing on Twitter, you know, back and forth. But I, I, I mean, this moment right now where it's so electrifying seeing people out in the streets um, and marching and protesting and seeing the work of seeing different writers also trying to engage within that space. I'm also curious about what that means in terms of sort of this ephemeral aspect of the digital space and the things that are being said and then the sort of that my my desperate hope that also we don't lose these texts, these these books and these you know these stories that are written down also as a way of kind of holding on to these things that are happening and, and and giving them some form and some shape. Wow, that was incredibly succinct. Um, so you all have raised a number of questions that are worth exploring, and I'll try and bring you all into conversation. Uh, however, it might make sense to take a break at this point because the there was a break in built and allow you all to stretch out and allow the audience to have a bit of a respite. I encourage the members of the audience to forward questions uh, which will help frame our discussion when we resume. So shall we say about a five to eight minute break and we'll take it up from there. Thank you. Thank you.